Hello, welcome along. It's another episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly Podcast. Thanks for giving us a listen. My name's Dan. This is the only podcast in the world that takes you out of this world and then gets you back home safe and sound in around about half an hour. Now this week, we're talking all about the European Space Agency's brand new Mars rover and how it's getting on before launch. Also, we'll talk about something that is so dangerous, it grows inside of you. And the whole point of its life is to break free from you, to worm its way out of your skin. Uh, Yeah, that's terrifying, and it's on the way. Also, we'll speak to a nature expert about something tremendous. Trees. Get it? Yeah, I'm glad. First, uh, let's head out of space, well, into space, sorry, to the smartest school outside of the solar system. This is Deep Space High. Deep Space High. Spaceports. Okay, everyone at Deep Space High, I'm ready to transmit my presentation on spaceports. You're going to love it. Transmitting in three, two, one. Now you've got to agree. Spaceports just sound, well, pretty cool. They make me think of a bustling futuristic place with astronauts and passengers getting their spacesuits on and loads of craft taking off. What's not to like? But it's not just cool. Spaceports will really help business and members of the public, like you and me, in lots of ways. Let me show you what I mean. For starters, spaceports will create jobs, lots of them, and not just astronauts. Although the plan is to try and use airfields that already exist, they'll need modifications and building work to make them suitable for space travel, from extending the runways to building vast hangars to maintain the spacecraft. That will take a lot of people, maybe someone you know. And once completed, they'll need people to run them smoothly, from air traffic control in the control tower to the chefs in the restaurants. And a spaceport would be a pretty lonely place without any spacecraft, right? And think about all the technology that will be needed. Rockets and space planes need motors, fuel tanks, high-tech materials that are tough enough for orbit and computer technology to make it work together. They'll also need vehicles to transport special equipment around. And where you have a spaceport, there'll be more demand for such things, and that demand would make it easier for engineering companies to get inventing and improve the existing technology. Now, I'd love to work at a company that works with space technology and if there are more of them around that seems like a good thing to me some of that new technology might be in say developing hybrid air breathing and rocket engines for a new breed of single stage to orbit space planes that's something which is already under research and development it's known as saber another way spaceports will help is in the delivery of small satellites into orbit Currently, whatever their size, satellites are launched using large rockets. That's not cost effective if your satellite is, say, the size of a sandwich box. So, if there was an easy and cheap way to launch it, that could be big business. And to make it cheaper to launch larger satellites, well, they could be taken into low orbit using a space plane, from where they could be launched further into space. A bit like in Star Trek, where smaller shuttles travel to larger ships already in orbit. And here's something that if you're lucky, you might get to experience for yourself. Whilst you might have to wait a while for a trip to Jupiter, it's very likely that it'll be possible to use space planes to travel around the Earth more quickly. Say a couple of hours to Australia, that's less time in the air before you can get to the beach. Or you could take a space flight experience where you pay to travel right up to the edge of space to experience being weightless and having incredible views of the Earth below. And that weightlessness won't just be a fun experience, it can help with science research too. A scientist might have an experiment where the results could be affected by gravity or the substances used. If that experiment could be carried out without gravity affecting things, scientists may get more accurate results, say for a new medicine or material something that could benefit us all. So, as you can see, there's a lot of reasons to get excited about spaceports. Uh Uh-oh, losing the connection. Catch you next time. Deep Space High. Spaceports. Support from the UK Space Agency. Find out more at bunkerslive.com slash space.
Right, let's give some shout outs to people who have said nice things about the show over on the Apple Podcast Store. Hello to Diva Demon. Nice name. Thanks for listening. Uh, also to the grandly named Legend 08. Thank you for listening. Also, hello to Wyatt, who's listening all the way over in Kentucky. And I'm so pleased that you're using everything you're learning in this, mate, to um, to tell your teachers and get a better marks at school. Uh, remember, if you've got a question about the sh- uh, science that you want answered on this show, that's how you need to get it done. Leave it as a review over on the Apple Podcast Store. Uh, Joel in Cheltenham has done that. Hey, by the way, I love Cheltenham, Joel. I love Cheltenham so much. I used to live there, in fact. Joel has asked, um, how do the Northern Lights work? Now, we've actually covered this before um, a while ago. Maybe you can't remember, which is okay. It's always good to go over this stuff and to remind ourselves. Have you ever seen the Northern Lights? They're around the polar regions of the Earth, normally near the North Pole. It's where the night sky can sometimes be filled with waves of these bright colours. And even though the sun is 93 million miles away, it has an effect on everything. You see, storms on the sun send gusts of charged solar particles hurtling across space. And if Earth is in in the way of these particles, they'll hit our planet's magnetic field and they'll react. Now, the charged particles excite the molecules in our atmosphere and they excite them. So they light up. They light up because the electrons move further away from the nucleus of the atom and then back towards it. They go in, they go out. When this happens, it releases a photon of light. It works a little bit like a neon sign, uh, a light like that. Uh, Electricity excites the atoms in neon gases, which cause a light, pretty much what happens in our sky. And the different gases we have in our sky give off different colours. So there you go, Joe. It's quite a complex one. So you might need to, you know, flick back 30 seconds or a minute and listen to it again. Just lodge it into your brain. But thanks for the question. Also, finally, hello to Rai Rai Ye, who I think has been on the show before, um, who asks, how, when you do weights, sorry, when you do weights, how do your muscles get bigger? I mean, first off, I'm never doing weights. My arms are a little bit like threads, like my T-shirt's broken. Anyway, it's pretty simple, this one. Uh, Rai Rai Ye, when you're working out, when you're lifting weights, your muscles become damaged. They get stressed. They break down a little bit. Then your body uses protein that you eat to repair the damaged muscle fibres. And to make sure that it doesn't get as damaged in the future, it thinks ahead. Your body makes the muscles stronger and bigger. So the more you work out, the more damage the muscle gets, but the stronger and bigger they heal. But remember, they do need to heal. So people who do lift weights need to give themselves time to rest so they can get bigger. Thank you so much for the questions. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered on this show, you need to leave that as a review over on the Apple Podcast Store. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. This week's guest is here to chat to us all about trees and how trees can help us out in loads more ways than really we'd imagined or even know about. Dr. Kieran Doik is from Forest Research. He's on the phone. Hey, Kieran. Hi, Dan. How are you doing? I'm really well. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, um, over the past year, Forest Research has published so many interesting things about the benefits of trees that we might not know about. We'll come to that in a bit. I was just thinking, what do Forest Research do? Well, we're a national body. In fact, we cover England, Scotland and Wales. And we conduct research that's internationally recognised. We conduct research into the the benefits and the value of trees, woodlands and forests. So it's not just trees in our towns and cities, which is what we're going to be talking about today. But we're really interested in an organisation a bit in about how we manage our woods, how we manage our forests, how we get the most from those, both in terms of benefits for society, but also in terms of um, timber production, you know, for um, for whether it's for fencing or timber for construction, all the way through to how we understand about all the pests and diseases that might cause damage to our trees. Well, let's start then talking about trees at a very basic level. uh, How much do trees affect loads of stuff that we do every day that we don't really know about? How good for us are they really? It's, it's incredible that trees are just so important uh, in so many different aspects of our life. In fact, probably so many ways, we just actually don't even stop to think about it. Um, the beauty of our towns and cities comes so often from the trees in our landscape. You know, whether you're walking down the street or you're looking out of your classroom, uh, down onto your school playground or across the, uh, the neighbourhood where you live, it's quite often it's the trees that provide the green and the, the real sort of landscape character. 
And it's actually really well understood now that having trees in our vision is really good for our mental wealth and, and our happiness. Um, so there's, there's a social side of things. Um, trees also provide a wide range of benefits in terms of, I mean, obviously climate change is a really critical one at the moment. And there's a lot in the news and in, in, <clears throat> in the press about how we should be planting trees to capture carbon and, and help combat climate change. Trees are really important as well because when it rains, they can capture some of the rain and they can slow down just how quickly that rain gets to the ground and how much of it goes into the ground and how much goes into the drainage system. So they can really be really useful for combating uh, flooding at a localised level as well as more of a neighbourhood level. Um, <laughs> how many do you want me to mention? I mean, it, it just goes on and on. They're quite often described as, as the lungs of the world, aren't they? The planet's lungs. I was wondering, and it's fine if the answer to this is no, Kieran, but do the benefits of trees change species to species for instance does a fir tree have a have different benefits to a birch the the benefits of trees do change between trees although it's probably better to say that some species are better providing more of some benefits now if you get the right tree in the right place you can always get benefits and that's that's quite simple to say but one of the benefits we haven't talked about yet is how trees can be really useful in cleaning our air. They're particularly good at taking particulates, you know, like bits of dust, if you like, out of the air. And, and that means it can clean the air, which is better for us, especially better for asthma sufferers. Now, trees with large leaves can capture more particulate pollution um, than, than trees with small leaves. But that said, if you think about a, a coniferous tree, so like, like your Christmas tree type trees, those trees are in leaf all year round, so they do cleaning all year round. Whereas your deciduous trees, in other words, your trees that lose their leaves in winter time, such as your oaks and your, your birches, they won't be catching as much uh, particulates in the winter. They'll capture some on their, on their um, trunks and on their branches, but because they're not in leaf, they can't capture as much. You mentioned earlier on, we, we, we're talking about urban trees. Can you, what actually is an urban tree? What, what, what's not an urban tree? Well, I work within the Urban Forest Research Group, so we're particularly interested in what we call the urban forest. And quite simply, that means any tree within the urban setting. So any tree within a town or a city um, or in the immediate outskirts to a town or city. So really, when we're talking about urban, we're talking about the built-up areas, our towns and cities, our villages, where really where population density is higher. And, and, a, and a tree that's within that setting is, is the ones that we like to focus on. Um, just because, uh, quite simply, you know, if you've got trees next to people, then you'll provide, those trees are providing benefits to lots of people just because there's lots of people around them. And and that's how, why we like to focus on them. And how do you figure out the best place to put a tree? If, For instance, if there's a new block of houses that pop up on the side of a motorway and you want trees there because it's better, as you mentioned, for the people's happiness and well-being, but also for their lungs uh, and their health, how do you kind of figure out the best place to put one of these urban trees? Uh, it's a bit chicken and egg. Sometimes you know you've got a bit of ground and you want to plant a tree there, so you say, well, what's the best tree to put here? And sometimes you've got plenty of space and you think, OK, we've got room for lots of trees. What's the biggest benefit we want to get? So in your example, if you've got a new um, sort of a, a construction going on, say a new school or a new um, housing estate, and you've got roads in the distance, you might want to get enough trees in there that they're going to form a bank, uh, you know, a solid wall of vegetation that's going to help stop those particulates those bits of fumes coming from the, the roadway into the schools, into the new development. So, it's, like I say, it's horses for courses. Think about what you're trying to achieve, and then you should be able to do um, good species selection to achieve what you want to do. There are so many different types of tree species out there, after all. And how much is the placement of trees dependent on where it is in terms of it being a town or a city? I'd imagine, you know, if you were to plonk a new tree down in the middle of London you might have to think a lot more about what that tree is than if you're sticking it on the edge of perhaps a smaller town somewhere. I would say it's a little bit more localised than that so if you were thinking of planting a tree at, say alongside a street within a pavement setting that's a different habitat or different growing environment to if you were planting it in a school grounds 
but you can have streets in rural and urban settings. So one really has to think about where you are. And, and then when, once you've got that in mind, say you're going to plant a tree on the corner of a new, or between two roads, then you need to think about, well, actually, how much space have we got here? And also, what type of soil do we have here? Are there any obstructions that we need to be worried about? Because we don't want to be planting trees where they're going to stop people seeing traffic lights and so on. So, you know, it's, it's, it's about looking at the local context, the soil quality, and then beyond that, thinking about, well, how big can we afford for this tree to grow in this location? And you might want to pick a smaller uh, specimen. You know, you mentioned London, and London, of course, is very well known for its London plains. And they can get absolutely huge, can't they? You know, you trunks so big that you take six children to hug them or more. So that, that's not appropriate necessarily for every setting um, uh, that we might be trying to plant trees in today. Last year, you published research that trees can help cool cities, taking pressure off air conditioners, uh, which can save the country millions and millions of pounds. How does that work? Why do trees help us cool down? Well, many of our listeners will know that trees photosynthesize. They take in carbon dioxide and from that they release oxygen back into our atmosphere. Now, they do that through their pores in their leaves called stomata. Now, when pores are open, when the stomata are open, you not only get gases, air going in and out of the leaf, but you also get water going in and out of the leaf. Now, water, you know, trees need water, just as animals need water to to live and thrive. And the water comes up from their roots. And one of the reasons that trees will keep their stomata open and let the water evaporate is actually to help cool the tree. You know, we as people, if we get hot, whether we've been running or we're just out in the sunshine, we tend to sweat, don't we? We perspire to cool ourselves down. Well, trees can also release water to help cool themselves down, as well as doing it accidentally. But, you know, purely because uh, the stomata are open, the water will come out. But for, for water to evaporate, it has to have energy. And the using up of the energy um, provides, uh, provides us with cooling. And um, it is, uh, when I was at school, I remember we always used to say evaporation causes cooling. It's a well-known catchphrase, certainly at GCSE level, evaporation causes cooling. So, um, uh, and so because of the, the trees cool the air, then when air conditioning units, such as we might have on the side of our buildings, when those air conditioning units try to work to cool down our offices and our school spaces, the air is already slightly cooler when it goes into the air conditioning unit, and therefore the air conditioning unit doesn't have to work as hard to cool the air, uh, and that's how they can save us some energy. Now, there's loads of different types of trees all around the country. What are their biggest threats at the moment? I don't mean them being felled. I'm talking about pesticides and diseases. What are really causing these trees to be at risk? Well, I'm not, I'm not actually the resident expert on pests and diseases. There are some quite scary um, pests and diseases in other parts of the world that we do worry about coming to our country. Um, there's one called the emerald ash borer, for example. It's a, it's a beetle that's mostly black, white spots. And if it came to our country, where we, I guess it would be a, a, a non-native uh, pest, if you like, coming in, it potentially could kill many different uh, species of tree. So there are some, what um, you know, in Europe and not that far beyond that we're worried about coming in. But of course, within the country, we also have a, a wide range of fungal-based diseases already threatening our trees. Um, you know, many of our listeners would have heard of ash dieback. It's a, it's a fungal disease that's slowly killing off many of our ash trees across the country. Um, and uh, whether they're young or old trees, uh, that's, a, that's a real horror story, I suppose, really, for, for our ash population at the moment. I've just Googled the, the emerald ash borer. This is the beetle, yeah. and it's, oh, it looks awful. Ugh, not, not something you want. Uh, anyway, so, Kieran, you're from Forest Research, which is part of the Forestry Commission. They look after tons of forests around the UK. And I know if you're listening to this and you want to learn more about trees and you want to get outside, the Forestry Commission always run just fantastic ideas uh, to get you kind of outside around nature and wildlife. So make sure you look them up online. Listen, Kieran, thank you so much for telling us more. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure, Dan. Let's do this week's Dangerous Dan, and it's a bizarrely terrifying one. I warn you, right? We're talking about the life cycle of the guinea worm. 
The guinea worm is a parasite that, unsurprisingly, causes guinea worm disease. Its larvae, its babies, live in fresh water around tropical parts of the world where it's not been treated, it's not been cleaned, so that's some of Africa and Asia. The parasite waits in the water to be drank by humans. Then, when it gets inside you, when the babies get into the human stomach, they will grow into a full-blown worm. Sometimes they can reach 80 centimetres. It's constantly growing inside your body. And then they'll make a baby of their own. When it's ready to then chuck its own larvae, its own babies into the world, it needs to find the air again. So the guinea worm will break through your skin. It releases a toxic chemical which makes you feel sick. It gives you blisters. It fills you with disease. And then slowly, the worm will start to wriggle free from the blister that it's caused. You'll look down one day and you'll see a tiny little worm slithering out of your skin. It grows in your body and then grows out of your body. Then it will head to water to hatch its larvae so the whole cycle can start over and over and over again. So I think we should learn a lesson from this one. If you're in the jungle, if you're near a pond full of water that looks a bit grimy, probably don't have a little drink unless you absolutely have to. Right, already in the show I've answered some of your science questions, but now let's answer some of your gadget questions with Techno Mum. Techno Mum's Tech Trivia with the Institution of Engineering Technology. Welcome back to Tech Trivia, the game show that tests the technical talents of our tremendous contestants. And playing this week, it's Techno Mum! Hi, I can't believe I'm still here. Well, you've played the course so far, but can you keep it up? Let's find out and spin the wheel. And today's category is durability. Your time starts now. Your first question is in two parts. What is durability and why is it important in technology? Hmm. Durability is about how well something will last. Engineers need their products to be durable because those products have a job to do and they have to be able to do it without breaking. And that's super important where safety is involved, like medical implants that help keep people alive and where it's hard to get replacements or repairs like in space or in the middle of the oceans. That said, even everyday items need to be durable because it can be expensive, not to mention annoying, to have to keep buying replacements or get things repaired. As well as choosing the materials and design carefully, another way that things can be made to last is by future-proofing them. This means making sure they're using new technologies which are expected to be around for a while or can easily be upgraded. Next question. What's a career where you'd be thinking about durability? Well, what about a console games tester? Did you know that there are people who are paid to test every part of them? Engineers call the area quality assurance. Some will check the game itself to check for bugs, but others will test the consoles to make sure they can stand up to hours of play. Sometimes machines are used to press the buttons thousands of times because you get a pretty sore finger doing that yourself. Nice answer. And last question. Name a cool innovation which helps products to be durable. Well, graphene is pretty amazing. It's a very new material which is created in a laboratory. Made from carbon that's only one atom thick, it's the strongest material in the world. It's incredibly thin and flexible, but unbelievably tough. Engineers are excited about this stuff because it will help make simple items very durable indeed. For example, at the moment, touchscreens on mobile phones and tablets use glass, and we all know how easily they can crack and shatter and how annoying that is. Graphene could be used with plastic to make screens that won't break. Well, your winning streak shows no sign of being broken. You're through to the next round, Techno Mum. Great, you could say I'm almost as durable as graphene. Techno Mum's Tech Trivia with the Institution of Engineering Technology. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash tech trivia. You're listening to the Fun Kids Science Weekly and the time is... Have a quick look at the clock, see when the time is when you're listening to this. And that must mean it's the time for Science in the News. The moment of crisis has come. Those are the words of Sir David Attenborough, who says that we've been putting things off in terms of climate change for far too long, and now we need to actually start doing things. We need to make it count, otherwise we've caused irreparable damage to the world and to our species. 
Also, new data suggests that our evolutionary cousins, the early humans, the Neanderthals, uh, may have dived under the ocean to get shellfish. Research has found shells in a cave in Italy, uh, and the scientists say that they must have been gathered from the ocean floor. Uh, and, th- and they also found tools from 90,000 years ago when the Neanderthals were around, which they say must have been used to catch clams. And finally, Europe's Mars rover... Rosalind Franklin has completed a key set of tests ahead of its summer launch. The robot was put in a thermal vacuum system uh, chamber to set to simulate the hot and cold conditions that it will experience on its way through space. And now it's being equipped with instruments to look for signs of life, either now or in the past. That's your science in the news for this week. And that is it for the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for finding us and giving us a listen. If you've not subscribed to the show yet, make sure that you do. That way, uh, the new episodes will drop into your feed every single week. You don't even really have to move a muscle to go and get one. Now, if that place you're subscribed is on the Apple Podcast Store and you've got a science question that you really want answered on the show, make sure you leave it for me as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly find us there there's a little place where you can put your name so i can say hello give us five stars that really helps me to see it and there's a box at the bottom that's where you leave your question and then i'll get to answering it hopefully in the next few weeks i might even get like a proper expert in that field to answer it for you Apple Podcast is also one of the best places that you can hear all of our science series. You've heard some today. We've got loads more. You can also get them on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, wherever you get your shows from. They're on the free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com as well. And Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. You can hear us all over the country on your DAB digital radio on that free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. 